Today we've got a very special video to show you. A scale model of the new G-Class tram has been built in a warehouse right behind me here in Tullamarine. And I and several others have been invited to come along and have a look at it. We've covered this before in a previous video, including why it's not called the F-Class tram, which you can check up here in the top right hand corner or in the video description below. We've had more information released since then, so this video is also a kind of update on that. So without further ado, let's get straight into the video. As a bit of background, the G-Class is the latest vehicle that will operate on Melbourne's tram network, the largest in the world. Announced last year, this medium capacity three carriage design is marketed as the next generation tram. It will eventually replace the final three classes of non-heritage high floor trams that still operate in Melbourne, the A-Class, B-Class and Z-Class. It will be able to carry up to 150 passengers, which is actually more than these trams that it will be replacing. 100 G-Classes will be in the first order, but given that it will be replacing all 313 A's, B's and Z's, it's a fair bet that more will be ordered in the future. This may also be an order for larger G2-class trams, which would have five carriages as part of the Flexity 2 family. That's a quick summary. If you'd like to see more details about its background, see my other video on the G-Class tram right here in the top right hand corner. At the Alstom warehouse here in Tullamarine, we were shown around the model of the tram and then left to have a look around ourselves. The very first thing I actually noticed was that the Extrapolis 2.0 train mock-up was still in this warehouse. You can see it here at the back of the building. It's been cut in half for storage, but very clearly still here. As for the tram, the scale model has been built to half its actual size, with a mirror in the middle to simulate its full extent. The outside has flat edges, but it still looks less boxy to me than the artist's impressions and pictures. It definitely gives similar vibes to the cabin design of the Extrapolis 2.0 train. Part of this boxiness is deliberate. The designers have considered safety, collisions and ease of maintenance for the front and rear chins. For example, there's a bar underneath the body that deploys automatically when the emergency brake is applied, to prevent anyone hit by a tram from being dragged underneath. Other safety features include cameras all around the exterior and interior of the tram, as well as an obstacle avoidance system to assist drivers. Before we move inside, I would like to mention something about the destination displays. As with the Extrapolis 2.0 train, I didn't find the front one easy to read, and I think that the orange text on black background displays that are currently fitted to most A, B and Z class trams are better than this yellow text on dark grey design. Maybe it's part of the mock-up not being 100% true to life, but I hope that what was shown here is not what is rolled out on the actual vehicles. Now onto the interior. The first thing I noticed was the width of the gangway between carriages. It's the widest that I've seen on any tram or train in Melbourne and presents very little of an obstacle to moving between different sections. Unfortunately, the seats, as with many modern public transport vehicles, are not comfortable. The padding is too thin and reminded me again of the seats on the C1 class trams. This might be okay for a short tram ride, but given the length of many of Melbourne's routes, I don't think that any trips into the suburbs would be very comfortable. Another issue with this tram, as with some others, is the width of the corridors. It would be very difficult or impossible to stand in these sections without completely obstructing the way. However, we were told the reason for this was the location of the bogies and need to accommodate essential services. So I guess there's no avoiding this. While we're talking about seating, the flip seats located in the center of the first and third carriages are a different design to those used on Melbourne's current trams and trains. When opened, the bottom stays down rather than automatically closing again, which I think is a big improvement. Another improvement is the passenger information displays. A lot of thought seems to have gone into these and it certainly shows. The main overall difference is consolidating information onto the same display rather than having multiple screens circling through with different things. I think this makes it easier and quicker to read, plus it shows connecting services of all public transport modes, and we were told that it can show disruption information as well. This gets a big thumbs up from me. Moving on to the rest of the tram, there are good facilities for passengers who need to stand. A new design of pole called an egg beater has been taken from the design of trams overseas such as Brussels. These are an interesting type of three connected metal poles to hold onto, without being connected to the roof of the tram, and can be used by people of different heights. The overhead handhold straps are logically positioned and can be moved around easily as needed, just like many of the current tram models. 
I also spotted these new Mikey readers. They have a Conduent logo on them, who were the company selected to implement Melbourne's next ticketing system. They are very similar to the Adelaide Metro card readers, in that they have a plastic section that sticks out at a 90 degree angle at the bottom to read Mikey's, credit and debit cards, and many other future payment methods. There wasn't any information on these at the mock-up, so I'm not sure about their status. One small but important feature of the trams is that there will be some openable windows. These are quite small, and there are only four in total, two at either end of the tram, but at least it's something. Another small thing I was very pleased to see is that the stop request buttons are push and not touch sensitive like on the C1 class tram. These touch ones cause no end of trouble as people accidentally brush or lean against them, causing unending beeping and the tram to stop unnecessarily. Push buttons like these are far better in my opinion. The layout of doors is also different to any other modern tram in Melbourne. In the past, designs have featured a door on only one side of the tram at the very front and rear, or none at all like the E-Class. The G-Class will instead have an extra door here to make it easier for people to get on and off the tram. While I think this is a great idea overall, I can see that with the limited space to move around that it could get quite crowded in inner city locations. But it does mean that there are these cool single seats at the front and rear of the tram, which we all agreed on the day would probably become the most popular places to sit. Some other things to mention include accessibility improvements. These include integrated hearing loops, more dedicated accessibility seats, and enough space for mobility aids and wheelchairs. We were told as well that DTP are looking at a number of research and development projects in the near future to help improve tram accessibility. While I could go on for a while longer, the final thing I'll mention is the power system. G-Class trams will have onboard energy storage and regenerative braking, which feeds electricity back into the battery as the tram brakes. It's a pretty cool piece of technology that has both sustainability and operational benefits. Not only does it reduce overall energy use, but it means that no new substations need to be built in the initial rollout, plus it allows trams to move under their own power for short distances. I think this is terrific and will have substantial benefits to minimising disruptions, as trams will no longer need to wait for maintenance vehicles to move at least a short way. It was great to go along and see what Melbourne's newest tram will look like. A new medium capacity tram has been a long time coming and is very exciting given how rare these are in Australia. The driver's cabin, as ever, was a popular place to sit and I did get my turn at pretending to be a tram driver. Construction of the first trams was initially announced to commence in late 2023 with the first trams entering service in 2025. However, given that we're almost at the end of the year at the time of filming, this will probably be moved back. You can expect to see these trams operating on routes 57, 59 and 82. Although, as we heard earlier, the announcements have said that they will be replacing A's as well as B and Z class trams. However, A class trams don't operate on any of these initial routes. This may be a hint as to where these trams may be deployed in the future. We'll also see the first new depot built in Melbourne since the South Bank tram depot opened in 1997. This will be built in Maidstone, with a short section of new track to be built to its main entrance on Williamson Road. The site actually has a very interesting history, which we've covered in an earlier video on the Maribyrnong Explosives Factory, which you can check out here in the top right hand corner. Not everything will be exactly what is shown in this mock-up. We were told that they have already made some changes based on user feedback and consultation. So if you're interested, you can stay up to date on the DTP website, which I've linked in the video description below. So after all that, what do you think about the design? Anything that you like, dislike, or have any ideas about? Let me know in the comments section below. So that's all for today. A reminder to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and thanks to everyone who's done it as well. Thanks again as well to Alstom and the Department of Transport and Planning for inviting me and everyone else along to have a look at the G-Class tram. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.